great to see all of you. Uh, it's been quite a week for Rick and I since we saw you last Sunday. Our daughter-in-law was in the hospital, hopefully going, went in last Sunday, hopefully going home today. Our grandbaby, I spent eight hours Tuesday in the hospitals with her, and she in the hospital overnight, and uh, still not quite normal, uh, but uh, doing so much better. And of course, it's gone through most of the family in lesser strength. So uh, we are here today, and we are ready to worship with you. Are you ready to worship? Let's worship God together. As Christians, we rejoice that when we seek God, God finds us first. We have come to claim our destiny. We have decided to become what we come yet again, the people of God. We have nothing to do and be what God calls us to do. We welcome you with thanksgiving to this time of worship, this place of empowerment and grace. Let us sing together, this is my father's world. commemorates the life and ministry of Jesus, remind us that his ministry is always and ever actively reaching out toward us. In this hour of worship, help us to be open to the challenges of his words, the power of his healing, and the opportunity to labor alongside him as both savior and friend. We offer our prayer to Christ our Lord, who lived, 
lives and reigns now and forever, and who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Psalm 15. Who may worship in your sanctuary, Lord? Who may enter your presence on your holy hill? Those who refuse to gossip or harm their neighbors or speak evil of their friends. Those who lend money without charging interest and who cannot be bribed to lie about the innocent. Such people will stand firm forever. As soon as we have our coffee hour today, we will move into our second annual meeting. That's where we elect our officers, receive our reports, etc. And then this afternoon is the 250th anniversary concert. This today will be at Water, at Water Donnelly at 3 p.m. On the tables downstairs, you will also find flyers and tickets for our Shrove Tuesday pancake dinner. You have the opportunity to share this event with others. There were people last year who were looking for a Shrove Tuesday pancake dinner that they could attend. This is open to anyone who wants to come. So. Take the flyers, take tickets, and uh, as you give them a ticket, collect the money, because these tickets aren't like our concert, they're not the free tickets, uh, and then turn the money in on Sunday mornings. God blesses those who, if our ushers would come forward and receive our morning tithes and offerings.
sent your son into our midst to teach us the things that are valued by the world are not the things on which you would build your world. We have heard these words time after time throughout the centuries, and still we follow the world, valuing the bold over the meek, the wealthy over the poor, embracing vengeance over mercy. As we give our gifts this morning, may we affirm for ourselves and to the world what Christ taught us, who is truly blessed in your sight. In Christ's holy name we pray, amen. as we celebrate our 250th anniversary. Uh, our second pastor, his ministry was terminated by the burning of our church in Parsonage and the, uh, the powder storage house in town when the British raided the town. And our third pastor came along at the reformation of the church, the, re the reorganization of the church. This was the Reverend John Pittman. He was probably one of the most interesting people to research. Uh, he was our pastor from October 26, 1786 to June 24, 1790. And as I said, he was the pastor immediately after the reorganization of the church. He was born April 15, 1751 in Boston, Massachusetts, the son of William Pittman and Mary Blower, or Blower, depending upon how you want to pronounce the name. Um, before I get into some of his other biographical details, I want to tell you a little bit about him. In 1770, as he was a young man, um, the British soldiers were quartered in Boston, and there was a, um, an intense annoyance and indignation to the Boston inhabitants. There were frequent quarrels that arose between the citizens and the soldiers. On the night of March 5th, the disturbance became a great, so great that the British troops fired upon the unarmed citizens in King Street, now State Street, causing the death of Crispus Atix a colored Indian, and four white citizens, Samuel Gray, James Caldwell, Patrick Carr, and Samuel Maverick. Daniel Webster said that from the moment the blood of those men stained the pavements of Boston streets, we may date the severance of the colony from the British kingdom. When those men fell slaughtered, a young man named John Pittman was near them in the surrounding crowd and kept watch that night over the bodies of the Boston martyrs. From that moment, John dated in his soul his patriotic allegiance to his native land and his severance from the British king. After the passage of the hated Boston Port Bill, he went to the hotbed of rebellion, Philadelphia. And within a week after the Declaration of Independence, he joined Captain Joseph Cowperthwaite's company under Colonel Dickinson in the 1st Battalion of Pennsylvania Militia and marched promptly off to Elizabethtown. His brother, Isaac, according to tradition, was one of the famous Boston Tea Party. So a little bit of history behind this person that we know as Reverend John Pittman. After all of this dust settled, he was baptized February 24, 1771 by the Dr. Samuel Stillman, who was the Baptist a pastor of the First Baptist Church in Boston. And he was received in membership to that church on March 7th, 1771. This is, he's 20 years old now. He married a woman by the name of Rebecca Cox from New Jersey on September 1st, 1778. She was the daughter of Colonel Richard Cox and Mercy Elizabeth Taylor of Upper Freehold, New Jersey. They had six children, five of whom lived. One boy and the rest were girls. His wife, Rebecca Cox, died February 4th, 1792, and within a short period of time, he remarried. His second wife uh, was her second marriage also. She was Mrs. Susanna Vaughn Green from East Greenwich, Rhode Island. And they, uh, she was born about 1748. So all of his kids were by his first marriage. 
During his time he was, uh, that he was a clergyman, he was pastor uh, of the church in Upper Freehold, New Jersey, um, from October 12, 1777 to April 10, 1780. Then they moved to Allentown, New Jersey, when, while he was an itinerant preacher from uh, April 1780 to April 1781. Uh, he did a supply work at the First Baptist in Philadelphia from 1781, September 1781 to January 1782. In 1784, he moved to Providence, back to his, uh, or, or maybe I shouldn't say back to, uh, yes, back, back to the church where he was baptized. Uh, that was Boston, I'm sorry. Uh, while he was in Providence, he supplied the Congregational Church in Attleboro uh, from 1785 to 1786 when he was called to this church on October 26, 1786, and he served here to June 24, 1790. From here, he went to the Baptist Church in Patuxet uh, in 1791 and later to the First Baptist Church, Seekonk, uh, and served there uh, from 1797 to 1822 when he passed away. His death was recorded as July 21st, 1822, in Rehoboth. It is written of him by Benjamin Bev yeah, Reverend Benjamin Pittman of Newport, who, by the way, says that he doesn't know that they are related, probably distantly. Uh, Benjamin Pittman writes, Mr. Pittman was not quite of the medium height, but was firmly built and had rather more than the ordinary degree of flesh. His face was round, his expression calm and dignified, his hair, as far back as I remember him, white, and his whole appearance singularly impressive. His original powers of mind were, I think, considerably above the medium, though it was for solid rather than brilliant qualities that he was distinguished. His excellent judgment rendered him a wise counselor, and this, combined with his kindly disposition, eminently fitted him for a peacemaker while he always maintained a gravity suitable to his character as a minister, he was as far as possible from anything austere or forbidding, or ever showed an interest, and ever showed an interest in the happiness of those around him. He was one of the most hospitable of men. His preaching was always characterized by well-digested and well-arranged thought. He had a good voice for public speaking, sufficiently loud to fill a large house, and yet bland and agreeable. His manner was not particularly impassioned, but it was dignified and solemn and natural withal and made you feel that he possessed the true spirit of an ambassador of God. His son was the Honorable John or Jackie uh, Pittman, who is uh, very well known uh, in, the, uh, in the region. Now, let us sing together, Rejoice, the Lord is King.
The scripture reading today is from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 18 through 31. The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction, but we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. As the scriptures say, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. So where does this leave the philosophers? the scholars and the world's brilliant debaters, God has made the wisdom of this world look foolish. Since God in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through, his, through human wisdom, he has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. It is foolish to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven, and it is foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended, and the Gentiles say it's all nonsense. But to those called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. This foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans, and God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame, shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God cho chose things despite, despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be a wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy, and he freed us from sin. Therefore, as the scriptures say, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. Amen. new growth, feel the warmth of the sun on our faces, we offer you our thanks and our praise. Let us use the gifts you have given us wisely, that we might hear the plea of others and respond accordingly, that we might see the needs of our neighbor and act compassionately, that we might feel the pain of another's loss and empathize in silence. Help us to be ever more tuned to the life of Jesus, free from the temptations that confront us and the busyness of our every day. When we are tempted to respond in anger, grant us the patience to return anger with kindness. When we want to insist on our own way, Grant us the grace to replace self-indulgence with unselfishness. When we are right at the expense of another's feelings, grant us the strength to be humble instead of right. When we are tempted to allow our families to be secondary to everything else we do, help us to rearrange our priorities. When we are tempted to live out our lives at a hectic pace, following our own agenda, grant us the wisdom to slow down 
and take time to hear what you would have us to do. When we are tempted to take the easy way out, to put desire over discipline, to let someone else take a stand for peace and justice, remind us that the easy way is not the right way in the kingdom of God. We lift before you so many of our friends and loved ones who are suffering from some form of illness, Lord. We pray that your spirit would be with them, that your healing touch would come upon their lives and make them whole. We lift before you this morning, Dennis in the hospital in Boston with heart problems, Debbie's sister Angie, her cancer has returned. We pray that you would be with them. We pray that you would be with Brenda and Jeannie and Johnny and Danielle and all of those others that we love who are suffering. May your grace be sufficient for all of their needs. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Our scripture text this day is found in Matthew chapter 5, the first 12 verses. One. We do, I'm sorry. Blessed are they.
Our te text today are the Beatitudes. One day, as he saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him, and he began to teach them. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad, for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. This week and the next three weeks sermons are based on what is commonly called Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. In the future, God will install a new structure, a new government, and this, he says, is what it will look like. But Jesus also said that God's word has already, in another sense, entered into our present age. The United States is an ethnically and religiously diverse nation. This is true of many nations, but what nations in the world are the most... You don't say each syllable here, homogeneous. This is our starting point for a discussion of another nation, God's world. What do the people of God's world look like? How do they live? What do they believe? What can we expect from them? It's no secret that American culture is one of the most diverse tapestries of humanity of any country in the world. Of course, South Africa's probably got us beat. We value diversity and multiculturalism because our country consists of people who literally come from every tribe and every nation. In many areas, you're as likely to hear someone speaking Spanish in the grocery store or Portuguese as you would the local American English dialect. For example, be it you all, youans, or yous guys, our cities are populated by a patchwork of ethnic neighborhoods, and a walking down the street can often seem like a tour of the world and its peoples. But not every country is as diverse. In fact, question, what do you suppose is the most ethnically homogeneous country in the world? Many people would immediately dial to Japan or the Koreas, for example, or some African nations. Maybe you'd think of the, one of the Arab nations or somewhere in Eastern Europe. Japan would be a good answer because of its tight immigration rules and significant learning curve for the language. Other nations are homogeneous because they are isolated either politically, like North Korea, or geographically, like some island nations. Even those nations that would seem to be traditionally homogeneous would seem to be changing as the world becomes flatter. 
and we become more technologically and physically linked by computers and travel. Many people in South Korea, for example, would still see themselves as ethnically homogeneous, which is still the official line of the country's Ministry of Education, Science, and Technology. Many Koreans hope that expressing their cultural homogeneity will appear to, North, appeal to North Koreans and lead to eventual reunification. At the same however, time, however, the country hosts immigrants from 126 different countries and races. As one South Korean professor points out, we are the Han race. And Han means sky. Sky embraces everything. So the term Han race is inclusive. There's a truth to that statement. No matter where we live or what ethnic tribe we're from, we all live under the same blue sky in God's good creation. While we pay attention to differences in culture, language, and race, God tends to evaluate us based on the characteristics that are more than skin deep. Indeed, in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus reveals that God defines the world much differently than we do, and in fact, is remaking the world in such a way that God defines God's people by their character and conduct more than by their heritage. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus redefines what it means to be a citizen of God's new world, a world Jesus called the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Those terms are used interchangeably. Who are the people of God's world? While we may all look different on the surface and speak a different language, Jesus reveals at the very beginning of his discourse that there are certain traits that will be in common for all of those who are becoming part of God's new world. Look closely at the Beatitudes and you might notice that they build on one another. The 20th century missionary E. Stanley Jones observed that you really could divide these nine Beatitudes into three sets of three, with each set of three Beatitudes following the same pattern, thesis, antithesis, and thin, thin, synthesis. When you look at them in this way, you begin to see that Jesus is laying the foundation for citizenship and in God's new world, which he will flesh out in the rest of his sermon. The first set of three begins with the thesis, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Plenty of people have debated what poor in spirit means, but here's where the context can help us. Remember that Matthew's gospel is written to a Jewish audience and is aimed at telling us that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of David and son of Abraham, and that he's the one who fills the law by embodying it. So when Jesus talks about the poor in spirit, our clue to what this means is found within the context of his own life and his character. If we want to know what being poor in spirit looks like, we turn to Jesus as the first example. In chapter three, three we read about Jesus' baptism where the voice of God says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That's an echo back to Isaiah 42, 1, when God is speaking to a figure called the suffering servant. Right at the outset, Jesus, the king of God's new world, is marked as a servant who came to give his life for the world. Jesus then immediately obeys the spirit in chapter four and goes out into the wilderness where he engages in radical self denial. To be poor in spirit combines these three traits of Jesus, servanthood, obedience, and self-denial. The one who is poor in spirit recognizes that he or she has nothing to offer God 
on his or her own, that his or her life has no purpose apart from God. They obey God not out of obligation, but out of his desire to gain something better, the life of God's new world. The poor in spirit are those who voluntarily empty themselves so that they can be filled by God. This leads to the second beatitude, which focuses the attention from the inward to the outward. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Disciples who are poor in spirit, who have turned their attention away from themselves, now turn their attention to the world and begin to see it as it currently is, a world in pain, a world where the selfish desires of sin dehumanizes people, a world full of violence, a world that has given up hope of redemption. Those who mourn are blessed because they are able to enter into the world's pain and grief and are not afraid of it. Synthesize these two beatitudes together and you get the third, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. We tend to think of meekness as wimpiness, as though our lives could be written as a diary of a wimpy Christian. But here, meekness is a combination of the previous two elements, the power and decisiveness of self-denial in the poor in spirit, and the passion and for the pain of the world in those who mourn. Those who want nothing from the world and at the same time are willing to share everything with it are the meek. They are terrible because they want nothing. Hence, they can't be tempted or bought. They are terrible because they are willing to go to any lengths, even to death, on behalf of others. The second set of three, with the image of the terrible meek still fresh in our minds, Jesus then turns to another set of three beatitudes that follow the same pattern. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, the thesis. Blessed are the merciful, the antithesis, and blessed are the pure in heart, putting them together. Whereas the first three Beatitudes gave us a pattern for emptying ourselves, these three teach us with what we are to be filled. Another way of translating the Greek word for righteousness is justice. Justice takes the meaning of righteousness out of the realm of the individual and into the realm of the whole world. The people of God's world aren't just those who do good. They do good for a purpose, to bring God's justice into the world. In other words, they are those who see their lives within the context of God's larger mission of redeeming the whole world. They do the will of God, but they see God's will as being bigger than themselves. They're not as concerned about their own eternal destiny as they are about the destiny of all of creation. They're less focused on justifying themselves than participating in God's justice for those who need it most. But righteousness by itself can easily turn into Pharisaic self-righteousness. That's why we need the balancing of the second beatitude in this triad. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Those who have hungered and thirsted for God's justice must begin to show mercy to those who need the justice the most. When you put the passion for justice and the compassion of mercy together, you become the pure in heart or the undivided in heart. Blessed are those whose life is geared toward a single purpose that is both righteously merciful and mercifully righteous. These are the ones who are blessed to see God because they see the movement of God and the purpose of God in every person. They see God everywhere because they are always looking for ways in which to live out God's purpose through obedience, mercy, service, love. 
They see God the way Jesus said they would, in the face of the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, the stranger, the least, the last, and the lost, Matthew 25. The third set of three, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are those who are persecuted, and blessed are you when people insult you. Take the meek who want nothing from the world, and the pure in heart who want nothing but God, put them together and you get peacemakers. The peacemakers are the ones who are resolute and active in their pursuit of reconciliation and justice between humans in conflict with each other, whether the conflicts between families, races, cultures, or countries. The peacemakers, in other words, are those who stand in the gap and are willing to engage conflict with peace, to work for justice and stay in that gap for as long as is necessary, despite the sabotage that will inevitably come from those who are unmotivated or unwilling to change. If peacemakers are the thesis in our preaching rubric for this material, the antithesis or that which acts against it is persecution. Jesus says that if you're a peacemaker, you are blessed. But Jesus also said, if you are a persecuted peacemaker, you are blessed again. The final beatitude, verse 11, is a variation of the previous one. You're blessed yet again if after persecuting you because of your peacemaking, they insult you and slander you lie and talk trash about you. History tells us that anyone who acts as a peacemaker will usually become one of the persecuted. Jesus is the ultimate example of that truth. As E. Stanley Jones once put it, peacemakers must get, must get used to the sight of their own blood. If there's any way of putting all of this together for the, this final triad of Beatitudes, it is in Jesus' concluding remarks. If you're a peacemaker, if you're a persecuted peacemaker, if you're lied about trash talk, persecuted peacemaker, well then, basically it's time to start rejoicing. Putting it all together is joy. The fruit of living a peacemaking, persecuted life, even a life that embodies all of the quality Jesus itemized in this list we call the Beatitudes is joy. Persecuted peacemakers are similar. In particular, can rejoice because they are persecuted for doing something worth persecuting. They rejoice because they were walking directly in the footsteps of Jesus and the prophets. They rejoice because their peacemaking, even if it cost them their own blood, is making positive change possible for others. The poor in spirit, the mourning, the meek, those who hunger for righteousness, the pure in heart, the merciful, the peacemakers, the persecuted peacemakers, the slandered, insulted and persecuted peacemakers. These are the people of God's world. The church is where we begin to develop this kind of character as we work and minister with each other. Living like this is a sign that God's new world is breaking all around us. The more we focus on living like the people of God's new world, the more likely this present world will start to look beyond races and borders and toward a brand new way of life. Let us pray. Lord, basically, you are telling us everything that hurts used together in your world can result in joy. Help us to be aware of your joy as we experience things that we would rather not experience. Help us to put it 
to use for your world. In Christ's name we pray, amen. More like Jesus would I be. through 